Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the October edition of uh, MICRA's webinar, this month being Healthcare Compliance, a year in review. My name is Hassan Abdallah. I am the head of healthcare compliance here at MICRA, and a uh, pleasure to be mediating and also uh, participating as a part of this discussion uh, as we look into, uh, look over the past year of healthcare legal and compliance challenges uh, with a really, really great group of speakers. Um, when, as we go through our discussion today, we're going to dive into multiple areas of healthcare compliance uh, and enforcement, spanning from reimbursement, um, the in-house provider uh, and counsel space, as well as external counsel, and then what are some of the challenges we're seeing, trends we're seeing, and of course, um, looking forward to some engagement from all of our participants and taking as many questions as we possibly can. So let's look over the agenda. So first, we'll start off with some intro of our group, and then we're going to get into the world of healthcare reimbursement challenges and specifically to start to discuss um, some of the areas of uh, enforcement and or challenges that healthcare entities are seeing in the world of reimbursement with Joe Rivet. And then we will pivot into a discussion about the role of in-house counsel and its ever evolving role in the world of healthcare uh, with FUDAD. And then we will pivot to uh, talking about enforcement actions and some of the trends that we're seeing in the healthcare sector uh, with Deb Giro. And we're gonna round out with uh, a key topic about investing into compliance, what that looks like, how to overcome some of the challenges there, and the role that each of us have played in that space. We'll go over some key takeaways, and um, I believe Teresa has um, put some commentary into the chat about q and A's. so please, throughout the entire presentation, please feel free to ask your questions, and we will surely get to them at the end, and anything that we don't get to um, will be um, following up on. Next slide, Teresa. A couple of things about MICRA. Uh, MICRA is an IQVIA business, a global CRO and a healthcare advisory firm. Um, and we really focus on penetrating different therapy lines across the healthcare, med tech, med device industries. Um, we value and position ourselves as an integrated service offering, um, being able to support our clientele across the entire regulatory pathway. Um, and it in, our team includes 25 plus former FDA officials, notified body decision makers, payer medical directors, industry veterans, and partners across the world's most respected medical institutions. Um, as a part of our service offering, uh, next slide, Teresa. We offer uh, of multiple verticals of services, including um, our global clinical CRO, but also in the world of REMA, Reimbursement Health Economics and Market Access, Quality Assurance and Staffing, Healthcare Compliance, Cybersecurity, Due Diligence, and our newly positioned AI and Imaging Center. Uh, at the end of our presentation, you'll have the ability to not only get the presentation itself, but also be able to uh, connect with people at MICRA and our presenters um, that will share their contact info with you. Next slide. Couple housekeeping items. If you have a question, as stated earlier, just submit that in the Q&A function. It's located in the bar at the top of your screen. Um, all registered participants will get a recording of our webinar after the event, as well as a PDF of the slides. that will be emailed to all registered participants. And if you want to contact the presenters, for each, the contact information will be included in the post webinar uh, to all registered participants. And you can always email info at micra.com for any questions about Micra's service offering and verticals that are, uh, were presented in the previous slide. All right, let's get into our introductions. Uh, so each of our speakers will present themselves. Let's start with Joe Rivet from Rivet Health Law. Great, thanks Hassan. Good afternoon or good morning, uh, depending where you're at in the world. Um, I'm Joe Rivet, I'm a healthcare reimbursement attorney focusing primarily on reimbursement. Um, and a strong area of me, uh, mine is denials and appeals. I worked uh, prior on the payer side for five years in fraud and abuse, so I've seen it from both sides, uh, currently representing uh, physician and physician practices, namely around uh, denial. So that's uh, my background. Started as a coder and biller, and then later in life uh, became a lawyer. So, 
Thanks, Joe. We'll move on to Widad Suleiman. Thanks, Hassan. Uh, as Hassan said, my name is Widad Suleiman. I am currently the AVP Assistant General Counsel for a uh, radiology practice known as Radiology Partners. We are a national private practice um, covering the majority of the United States. I, prior to this role, served as corporate counsel and the compliance officer for another radiology practice uh, based out of uh, the state of Michigan. And prior to that, I worked for a healthcare boutique law firm focused solely on representing providers. I cut my teeth in uh, medical malpractice, representing providers in all sorts of actions from deliberate indifference claims all the way to state med mail claims, and then transitioned into more of the transactional space representing providers um, in deal making, in licensing matters, and uh, revenue cycle um, management issues. So um, compliance and healthcare law are my bread and butter, and I'm excited to be here today. So thank you to you all. Thanks, Redad, and we'll round out with Deb Juro. Thanks, Hassan. Um, as he says, I am Deb Giro. I am a shareholder and the co-chair of the healthcare industry group at Butts Along here in the Detroit area. I would like to say I had, you know, prior experience, but I've been with Butts so long, it's been my entire career. Um, I focus on healthcare, fraud, waste, and abuse, doing litigation, um, false claims act cases, and the like for virtually every type of provider that can be subject to the False Claims Act, uh, defending those providers. Um, I also do a large part of um, cybersecurity, um, helping healthcare industry and non-healthcare industry and in cybersecurity incident response reporting and notification. Um, and I kind of round that out with other issues that healthcare providers are faced with, including debarment, appeals, um, licensing actions, and the like. So glad to be here today. Thanks so much, everyone. Pleasure to be with you all and really, really great group. So we can jump into the next slide and start diving into our first area of discussion. And so some of these, uh, I will direct some questions to um, specific individuals and then after um, I would love if everyone else, if you have it, you know, we that, uh, um, if you have any additional commentary on there, uh, please feel free to chime in. So to Joe, within the world of healthcare reimbursement, um, one of the areas that we are consistently seeing a lot of challenges around have to do with claims denials and appeals. And I know this is an area that you um, particularly spend a lot of time in. So can you give us an overall state of the current world of reimbursement in healthcare what are some of the things that you're seeing, some increasing trends and challenges that healthcare entities are facing? Yeah, so a couple of things. One is there are, and I'll, and I'll fold in denials and appeals with also payer audits that kind of all lump together where we're either not getting our money or money's looking to be taken back. Um, we're seeing a lot of clients undergo audits, uh, payment demands, around COVID services. I think it's now starting to catch up all the data analytics. The problem with those audits that we're seeing is from a plan perspective, when they pull those data files to determine if a practice has a potential overpayment, they're just pulling a huge chunk of data over a broad day range. The issue with that is that there were so many executive orders that were coming out either daily or weekly basis from CMS that there are a lot of exceptions within those rules. And unfortunately, the payers are not paying attention to those very finite exceptions, therefore coming to really a wrong conclusion that, there, that there's an overpayment. Unfortunately, the practice is saddled with defending those, uh, as Deb pointed out, I mean, that's a lot of what we do in various aspects of our work, um, but that's something that we're seeing a lot of. The other part is, with AI and different um, uh, analytics from um, the technology standpoint, it seems that there's there's far more um, denials that frankly I think are erroneous. Um, we see them pretty much on a daily basis that are causing cash flow problems or slowdowns uh, with practices. Just because you have a denial or, or overpayment demand doesn't mean that it's correct. 
um, and you shouldn't be bashful about exercising the administrative remedies that are available to challenge those. Um, and it, you know, what we do on a daily basis, a lot of times it doesn't take a huge amount of time. Sometimes it can, uh, but you can navigate those waters to make sure that you get get your money back. Prior authorizations is probably at an all time high. Uh, the OIG has done some audits on those and has uh, found some pretty troubling findings around those. And then there becomes an issue of traditional Medicare with your uh, Part C coverage or your uh, Medicare Advantage plans, where sometimes they're not lining up, yet they're denying services under Medicare Advantage for what a traditional Medicare beneficiary would otherwise enjoy, which conflicts with the CFR. So that's kind of a, a mixed bag, but those are some, I think, the, the higher volume areas that we're seeing currently. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Speaking to that, um, one of the things that you know I consistently hear about um, is not only dealing with the inability for some of these entities to handle the amount of audits that are coming through post-COVID, but the challenge of whether um, dealing with their billing team being outsourced. What are some things that you're seeing, uh, particularly those that are overseas, um, you know, for cost purposes, which historically have helped a lot of practices, but what are some challenges you're seeing even operationally with some of those practices where they're outsourcing their billing function and now in the audit space are not being able to kind of connect the dots? Yeah, so I, I would say from an outsource perspective, a lot of times it's, it's seen as a negative, uh, regardless of, of how you're paying a person, whether they're a contractor or they're an employee, or regardless of where they're at on the globe, there's there's really talented people, but the 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 pressures become production. And when you get into billing and coding and working claims, we understand that you have to move them through. But the second that you start placing that on a production or quota or productivity, it doesn't matter if it's outsourced to another country or um, not, you're gonna run into the same challenges. Even the best and brightest, regardless of where they're at in the world, um, there's so much pressure on production that they don't have the, the really the time or maybe they don't have the expertise where you're, they're getting into the weeds, understanding state statutes, federal statutes, looking at the provider agreement, understanding the distinction and difference between an ERISA plan and not an ERISA plan and what goes behind it to, to really effectively challenge those denials. Um, they just don't have the time and they may not have the expertise to do that. Um, and that's where folks like us can, you know, come in and kind of help round that out. Not everything a lawyer needs to do, um, but there are some things where it, it's certainly helpful. But knowing some of those finer points are, are helpful. When you get into denials, I was just working one this morning. I was un able to unplug about $50,000 for Behavioral Health Group. From a plan perspective, I knew that the claims were correct, but it was it was likely a configuration issue. Working with the plan, indeed, that's what it was. Now all those claims are going through to get reprocessed. Doesn't take a huge amount of time, but but having that level of of depth and expertise, uh, you you really kind of can't get that when you look at volume daily production of billing. Even if you move it to an internal audit or supervisor where they don't maybe have the same volume, but again, their skill set's only going to go so deep. And and I don't know everything, but um, you know we have a little bit more time and a lot more resources to kind of dig into those uh, for practices. Yeah, re really good points there. And um, just my, my next question to you is, what are, what are some of the key changes in regulations affecting the reimbursement process? So at the top, we talked about a lot of the things that happened in the COVID space, it was kind of a wild west, right? There was um, mm -hmm. the, the floodgates have opened with claims that were paid and now um, yep. things like the No Surprises Act have come in. So what are what are some key regulatory legal challenge or changes that are at play that you feel healthcare entities should really be aware of? Yeah, so I'll talk about it from just a re reimbursement perspective. Certainly the No Surprises Act, um, Texas um, is very active and really kind of poking some holes in that uh, federal law. So it kind of looks like Swiss cheese. Who knows where this thing's going to end up and land? There's some issues around the IDR process to the state. 
um, that are still within within the federal court. So I think that's one to keep an eye on uh, to the extent that it impacts your practice. Layered with that will be the state law that have balanced building protections. Um, not every state has those. From, from a uh, Medicare reimbursement, um, we're waiting for the final rule, the Medicare physician fee schedule, um, looking at the proposed rule, nothing really earth shattering that I saw uh, from that standpoint, I think telemedicine or telehealth, that door has kicked pretty wide open. Um, that's probably one of the benefits if there are any from COVID um, expanding those particular reimbursements. Uh, I would say the other ones are in the proposed state, there's a gold card uh, proposed uh, rule that's sitting there with the House and Senate in DC. That's getting more endorsement of bipartisan really addressing uh, prior authorizations. It's not the only proposed legislation out there. There's there's a handful of them, both at the federal and many state levels around that. Um, so I think that there's some stuff to come that might actually help from, from a provider side, so. Thanks, Joe. Uh, anything from Widad or Deb before we pivot into the next discussion? Um, the only thing I wanted to touch on for the No Surprises Act from the provider side is just really, um, the strong arming of uh, impact that is occurring on the provider side. While the intent of the act um, was price transparency and not having um, the, the electorate deal with surprise bills after receiving emergent or non-emergent care, um, payers are uh, taking advantage of some of these opportunities by um, sending out notices, terminating uh, favorable contracts to providers, um, essentially pushing them to then accept uh, decreased rates um, and under reimburse for care, leaving the provider to then have to go through the IDR process that Joe mentioned. But the IDR process is um, <laughs> severely backlogged. I think the government anticipated, yeah. what, 20,000 cases when they first ruled out NSA. And I think it's somewhere upwards of 400,000 cases. Um, so payers are now um, essentially forced to um, either try to engage with the, uh, or I'm sorry, providers are forced to engage with payers for open negotiations if the payers even agree to that. Um, and even if they do reimburse, it's not timely. So, I mean, the providers are really just having such a difficult time when it comes to it, uh, cash flow, essentially, um, with the NSA. And um, it's really forcing providers to either accept the low initial payment or really go through this long, drawn out process um, to accept payment down the line. Yeah, really good points across the board there. Thanks for that. Okay, Teresa, we can go into the next slide. All right, now we're opening the discussion on the role of in-house counsel, specifically within provider groups. And with that, I know this is a role that you play at Radiology Partners. Um, so can you give us a little insight into the kind of your examination of the evolving role of in-house counsel the role it plays with, you know, across different business sectors within the company, especially compliance and operations. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the first thing that I, I notice now in, in this role is just purely how an in-house counsel is no longer just the attorney in the room. Um, that's the first takeaway. And it's really all about being a value providing individual um, because oftentimes, um, as we all know, in the healthcare space, everything is cross um, sectional. So when we're sitting down and meeting, um, you know, reviewing uh, our RCM um, budgets in our, in our reports, it's, not only uh, RCM folks in the room, it's legal, it's compliance, it's operations, it's C-level. And then when you tie in the physician element, so I, I work for Radiology Partners, which is a physician owned in part practice. You also have the shareholders, you have the board of directors, you have committee members, and then you also have your external subject matter experts and your external counsel. So as an in-house counsel, you are the orchestrator among a lot of these varying groups. So um, it really is threading the needle and knowing when to tap certain individuals for the right topic, right? Because you don't want to be the person that's bringing in everyone and anyone that may have something to say on a topic, but also it's about making sure the stakeholders that have um, important um, information to provide are in the room when the decisions are being made. So I really think that um, moving away from being just the lawyer uh, reviewing contracts purely in a transactional space to more of this multifaceted role um, is one of the the biggest takeaways and you really need to start as an uh, as an attorney to 
learn to speak the language of your counterparts. So um, I know, Deb, you mentioned that uh, cybersecurity and incident reporting is obviously a huge topic right now, given the ransomware attacks we've seen in the last year. So as an in-house counsel, you need to be able to be in the room with your CISO, your IT professional, or whoever, and talk the language of, okay, well, how exactly were we hit? Can you review the forensic report and really understand what exactly were um, the infrastructure points that were being leveraged that you know allowed for this malware attack or what have you so it really is all about um becoming a subject matter expert um in the varying fields that are important to your practice so like in radiology it's a very tech heavy um industry so it's really understanding how do the feeds from the hospital get to the provider that sits you know in hawaii when the read was done in michigan etc so i think it's really just the evolving responsibilities and the roles as the orchestrator um is really important because everyone is essentially going to look to you to know who to tap in when the the issue arises so i think that's one Thing, one thing, and I see here on your slide here, cross-functional influence. I mean, I think that's exactly it. The collaboration piece um, is so, so key to being a successful in-house counsel. Yeah, thanks for that. I think one thing you and I have even talked about quite a bit is um, when you start talking about the cultural influence of legal and compliance within entities, right? Whether you're outside an external compliance consultant or in-house counsel, um, Historically, this is something I've seen consistently be a, a challenge, right, for a lot of companies, a lot of clients, because there is a, I don't want to even maybe throw out the word distrust, but there's a hesitancy, right, mm -hmm. about what what am I actually sharing? How much can I share? Um, can you talk to me a little bit about how you've balanced that, particularly as now within a provider group, you have such an impact on day-to-day -day operations, you have, you're, you're diving deeper into the realms of the business that really have an increased sphere of influence than just specifically a legal role. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think with any thing that um, in a provider group, there are sensitivities around um, lanes, right? So if, for example, someone were, especially between legal and compliance, um, just by way of the structure that OIG uh, requires us to have, right, in terms of our seven elements and the compliance officer being the owner of the program. However, uh, legal plays a large role in preserving uh, privilege and preserving the interests of the client at the end of the day. So I think a good example when we talk about how you navigate some of those sensitivities is looking at the relationship between legal and compliance because it's so symbiotic, but it also has situations where there are certain aspects of an issue, whether it be an audit, um, an enforcement action, what have you, that comes through. And there is a specific role that a compliance officer plays, but then there's also a specific role that in-house counsel plays. And how are the two individuals or groups or uh, departments working together where I don't feel like I'm stepping on the CEO's toes and vice versa, because I can't do my job as uh, counsel um, by creating conclusions, um, working on my work product without having the compliance officer's reports um, ready to go and available. And, you know, I can't also try to clout, clout everything in privilege either. So there's this, this really big um, dance, I guess, that we have to play with one another. And I think the the end of the day, working for a provider group, um, if we all sit down and think about, okay, why are we here? It's really to protect um, the practice and to make sure we deliver good patient care. So if we can both agree on those two things, then we can find a way to um, essentially do our jobs. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay, before we get into a discussion point, anything from Joe or Deb that you want to add? I think we would touch on a couple of important points is is really kind of knowing the distinction between legal and compliance um, and, and the very specific uh, roles that they play are are critical, I think, for an effective compliance program. Um, and to a dad's point, which um, I think it's really important is understand when you have to reach out to legal, whether it be in-house or if you don't have in-house external counsel of like, hey, we got a time out here, kind of like in the OR, where we might have a potential problem and then let the attorney determine if we need to put this under privilege or not, because to a dad's point, collectively, we're all looking out for uh, the, the organization um, and it's got a trickle down effect to the patients. And if, if we don't have a healthy organization, uh, everything else kind of crumbles. And I think that's something that falls 
uh, particularly on inexperienced uh, compliance officers, understanding that distinction and how important it is to have that relationship with general counsel, of, whether it's in-house or external, and knowing when to call a timeout, because typically the compliance officer should have that authority and, and go directly to legal counsel without having to go through other layers of the organization. Yeah, re really good points there and a, and a good, uh, go ahead, Deb. Well, I was gonna say, you know, kind of like following up on what my dad um, said about the, the kind of dance that is done between the general counsel or outside counsel, whatever, whatever you're you're utilizing and the compliance piece. Yes, there is a symbiotic relationship between the two, but there are very different roles that each of them play. And from from the government's perspective, they look at both of those as separate entities or, you know, aspects of the compliance program and the overall compliance of the entity. And yes, the the attorney should be sitting in at the table when compliance issues are being discussed, but they shouldn't be thwarting the compliance officer's role in reporting to the board saying, we've found these issues and we need to do something about it to fix it. So it's it's a it's a funny dance because they seem to be very similar tasks, but they they actually are different. And recognizing the difference between the two is is kind of a hard concept to come by. But the government, the OIG, and their you know corporate integrity and grievance and in the general compliance program guidances that they have out there. They do make those differentiations between the two, you know, the council and the compliance. Yeah, great, great points, Evan. And we're we're actually going to touch a little bit on that um, in this next discussion point uh, or deep dive even further. Actually, next slide, please, Teresa. So this is a question to all: um, How have you seen the effects of compliance investments or the absence of? impact your clients or organizations, especially in light of the continued focus from the DOJ on importance of compliance across all business functions. And for those uh, attendees, when you get the slide, we've embedded the Department of Justice's evaluation of corporate compliance program, the most recent one from September into the presentation. Um, so this is an open discussion uh, for all. I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um one of the things that really resonates with me and with my clients is having an effective compliance program, one that identifies the risks, how you deal with those risks, and how you remedy any shortfalls, gaps in your, your program and your operations is the difference between, you know, if you want to put it in monetary perspective, paying damages that are alleged or trebling or tripling those damages. So, you know, that's that's one thing that investing up front in a good compliance program is something that you'll see down the line as being an appropriate investment, even though you don't see anything in the initial aspects of it. Since this is healthcare, I always liken a good compliance program to preventative care. You know, healthcare professionals know that preventative care lessens the, the amount of services, the amount of money expended for a particular illness or anything else, right? Versus waiting until you have an acute episode and you've now ballooned all of the costs associated with addressing that acute episode. And so a compliance program is the preventative care that every healthcare organization needs to have so that it doesn't balloon into something acutely problematic down the line. The other thing that's really good about having a good compliance program, having an effective compliance program, if you run into trouble with anything, be it billing or, you know, typically it is billing, showing the government that you have an effective compliance program, that you're on top of things. We all recognize that nothing is foolproof. The, the government recognizes that. 
but it's the efforts that go into trying to avoid that, that they look at. And it's the difference between increased penalties, but it's also the difference between debarment from the program, a, a um, CIA with the government where you've got a three to five year oversight of all of your operations, all of those things go into having an effective program. So if you have it up front, you front load your program and you carry it out. You don't just set it on the, sh the proverbial shelf and say, we've got one, here it is. Um, it, it, it goes a long way from an enforcement perspective to reducing all of the liabilities attendant to that. With that, Joe, any uh, input, commentary on the question? Um, yeah, I think all of those points uh, are are well said. On um, uh, on the in from the in-house perspective, I think it really comes down to um, you know if you've ever been in a room with an operator or a C-suite level member and you come to them with a problem and they say, "Well, why didn't we know about this?" Right? Like that's usually one of the first couple questions. And um, this isn't mine, so I'm not going to take credit for it, but someone had mentioned that, you know, you want compliance or legal to be the, not the department of no, which is something that people say we are um, in the department of no, K-N-O-W, right? So it's like that we know proactively what is happening um, on the ground level, especially as it relates to billing um, and, and other aspects that are really important as it relates to enforcement actions. Um, because, like Deb said, if if we're on the front end and our compliance program is proactive as opposed to reactive, we may catch a um, HL7 feed issue at the front end where it's only a clerical error, right? And we can potentially make those changes um, and be proactive and report that to the payer or to Medicare and not be hit with any kind of overpayment issue down the line, as opposed to us finding out a year, two years later, and then having to do a retrospective payback money potentially um, be hit with damages. And um, I, I think the ask to a board member or to a physician committee to say, look, an investment in the compliance program now when there's no problem as opposed to when there is a problem um, is usually an easier sell as well. Well, I think it, and the other thing that you touched on, Wadad, is the fact that if you have that compliance program in place and you're actually carrying it out, the billing irregularities, you'll find those mm -hmm. in due course, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's when you don't do anything about it. And if it's a year later and you've been sitting on it, there's an assumption that every provider checks the billing and reimbursement that comes in. And so if you have a claim or a bunch of claims that you find out a year later were improper, you're also subjecting yourself to criminal and or civil liability under the False Claims Act because we had that lovely little piece of, of legislation, the, the reverse false claims, that if you don't pay them back within 60 days, it becomes a false claim because a false claim is either proactively making a false statement or inactively making you know no Knowing statement and that statement yeah. is retaining monies that you are not entitled to so you're yeah. also opening yourself up to a host of other legal battles that you just don't want to have come across your desk now i would say from a compliance investment you know how are we defining investment if you're a hundred million dollar practice and you're spending a hundred thousand on compliance, it's a little hard to say with a straight face that you're really investing with compliance. Um, you know, you get what you pay for and you pay for what you get. I think hiring, whether it be internal or co-source arrangement, compliance officer, not every practice needs a full-time compliance officer. There's a lot of ways in which you can do it, but hiring a really good quality compliance officer that knows the industry, knows how to interface with legal, raise things appropriately, look at things that are on the horizon, um, and to Deb's point, really kind of can almost continually doing a diagnostic of a, from a prevention standpoint in a practice. Those are comes with really highly skilled people um, and you pay for them, but it's much cheaper uh, than paying for a penalty 
uh, or some type of repayment or entering into a CIA. But I think what happens is, you know, HR does a market analysis, et cetera, compliance officer is X, and it's hard to seat that role with really good talent. And it's becoming, I think, far more complex today than it was even five, 10 years ago. So I think really having an appropriate budget, and then there's no magic number, but um, really truly um, underscoring what investment means, which is also you know engaging counsel where it's appropriate. It's less expensive to engage them in the beginning than it is when there's a huge problem. So. I think knowing what investment means to your organization is really important. All really good points. And, I, I, and I'm and i going to comment a little bit later in a later slide about this again, um, just to all of your points. So great, great discussion there. Uh, but we're going to go on to the next slide and start talking about enforcement actions. Uh, and so, Deb, we're going to open up with you. And if you um, what I included here is just, you know, some of the types of enforcement actions and areas of governance throughout the healthcare sector. Um, but if you can maybe talk to us about, um, you know, some of the trends and overview of recent enforcement actions uh, in the world of healthcare and things that you're seeing. Yeah, thanks, Hassan. Um, th that is a very comprehensive list that you have on that slide. Um, it's probably not the only, you know, it, it is not fully inclusive. Um, so true. there are other things that are that need to be considered and that the government can use in its toolbox of enforcement um, capabilities. But what I wanted to focus on were probably two of the most principal areas that we're talking about that kind of hit with those lists. Those are fraud, waste and abuse and data privacy and security, because those are two really hot buttons. We always hear about fraud, waste and abuse. And every year, you know, we see what typical schemes, if you will, that the DOJ is really honing in on from a, a fraud, waste and abuse perspective. And I think the best piece of information out there to know what the government's looking at is to look at what they do in these national takedowns. It's, you know, for the past probably 2014, so probably the past eight to 10 years, the heat task force which is the health enforcement and i can't remember what the acronym starts uh stands for but you know these are these are multi uh jurisdictional entities it's it's the fbi hhs's oig state law enforcement um other aspects of the doj and they use the information that they have electronically about what's going on so they have the analytics to determine where the hot spots are what what the issues are and in these national healthcare takedowns um they they go after multiple i mean hundreds of individuals on a number of different issues so in 2024 and i think joe you talked about this in your piece where the government's now catching up on COVID and PPP fraud, right? So in the in the most recent takedown, which was in June, there was some there was nearly 200 defendants that were that were charged at the same time. I mean, they literally go and it's a it's a one day or two day takedown and they just go into all of these defendants' places and just start taking all of the equipment charge the individuals you know it's it's a it, it's a dance that they do amongst themselves and in this year's schemes that they've been looking at some of them we've seen in the past the the past couple of years some of them are new um but i made a list of them and it was kind of interesting there were fraud schemes related to amniotic wound grafts for vulnerable uh, medicare population this, you know, these are these are individuals who don't meet the medical necessity for these these services, but they're very highly compensated services. And in the national takedown, the charging documents claim 900 million plus in false claims related just to amniotic wound care. Um, other other concerns that we've seen, and I think this is something that we've been seeing for many years, is related to um, the opioid epidemic and other 
um, substance use, mind altering drugs. So there's been a slew of activity regarding unlawful distribution of Adderall and other opioids and stimulants, um, particularly those that are related to dispensing or prescribing through digital medicine technology. Um, you know, so there you have a lot of times where you really don't even have a, pa a physician patient relationship and they're, they're giving prescriptions for Adderall. Um, some of the other things that we've been seeing is misbranded and adulterated drugs. Um, a lot of focus has been on the behavioral health, especially the addiction treatment um, providers, um, telemedicine and lab fraud. So they're, they're all kind of interrelated. And then you have your kind of catch all that the government always goes after, which is rendering of medically unnecessary services or services that have never been rendered, COVID testing fraud and things like that. Interesting, in the national takedown, there were seven defendants located in Michigan. All but one were in the eastern Michigan, Detroit area, so Wayne County and Oakland County. Um, so that, that kind of gives you an idea of what they're looking at. I know another issue, and this is based on personal work that I've been doing. I have a few clients that are in the DME POS arena, especially as it relates to CPAP supplies, BPAP supplies, and sleep studies. Both the federal government and the state attorney general in Michigan are looking at those types of providers and seeing if they've met all of the criteria for reimbursement for Medicare and or Medicaid for those particular services. Um, from a cybersecurity perspective, this is where it gets interesting because it's one of those areas that it's it seems an impossible task to keep up with the amount of regulations that have been coming out on a probably monthly basis, if not even more frequently. HIPAA, as most of us probably know, had some major amendments um, at the end of last year and earlier this year as it relates to predominantly reproductive health services and how you can and cannot use that and how you need to treat those records. So that's something that providers need to look at and adopt their policies and practices accordingly so that they're not running afoul of those particular HIPAA regulations. Cybersecurity is another area. Um, you, you know, the state of Michigan does not have a federal data, you know, privacy regulation, nor does the federal government because they can't agree on anything. But Michigan has one on the books. And there are, I'm trying to remember, I want to say there's, um, let's see if I have this written down here. There are a number of states that have comprehensive data privacy that encompasses medical data. Um, so not only do you have HIPAA for medical data, you also have to remember to comply with other federal and state laws. You've got substance use provider laws and the revisions that were made earlier this year to the federal confidentiality of substance use disorder laws, and that aligned it with HIPAA. So you've got issues with that particular type of, of medical record. You also have the FTC has enforcement jurisdiction that can come into play uncovered entities to the extent that they either have a online portal for their patients um, or if they have an app or even their website and that gets into the whole tracking technologies. So there's been a lot of enforcement action by the FTC on violations of, of individuals, privacy rights related to health data on different portals. And you know, some of the more notable ones are better help um, had a fairly significant FTC fine um, and corrective actions imposed upon them earlier, um, as did GoodRx, where, you know, the concept there is that when you have a website or a portal, you have diagnostics and analytics on the back end that collects all of this 
information that would cl would classify as PHI under HIPAA or protected information under the FTC. And these, these databases were providing that analytical data to the Googles and the Metas so that they could target advertise outside of that without telling the individuals that they were doing that. So it was a lot of, you know, when you sign up and you consent to all of our terms of use and go, you know, six pages down and you might find it and you should read it, they weren't fully disclosing it. So the FTC can come in and say, you know, this is deceptive practices as it pertains to them. And so we've seen some significant fines from the FTC. We still see significant fines from, from OCR, the Office of Civil Rights for HHS enforcing HIPAA. You know, just the other day, one of the big pushes that they've been doing is right to access. There's been probably in the last year or two, um, some 30 enforcement actions that they've published. There's probably been others, but they publish specific ones to let the industry know what you should and shouldn't be doing. So they're making an example of people. And one just came out two days ago where it was a $70,000 penalty on a small practice who didn't give the patient their medical record. You know, and, and when you read that type of information, you look at it and just say, okay, HIPAA, it gives them this information by right. And, if you're not doing that, we're going to impose a lot upon you for violating that. So, you know, $70,000 for not giving one medical record or two medical records, it, it just doesn't make sense. And so, you know, mm -hmm. the, the OCR is using their enforcement capabilities on a regular basis and saying, do it. You know, there's absolutely no reason why they can't have you as an individual can't have your information. And if you're not giving it to us, giving it to them in a timely fashion, we're going to penalize you. Um, some of the other things that we're seeing from an enforcement perspective. In late 2021, the DOJ came up with this civil cyber fraud initiative, and they have, I think, implemented it in two or three separate cases that I'm aware of. And what it is, is it's it's using the False Claims Act, which is the, go the government's greatest weapon to combat fraud and abuse and everything else, but they're using it in the cybersecurity context. And how they're using it is if you're indicating that, you know, to the government, just like any other false claim, that you have cybersecurity standards and practices in place that meet what the the requirements are of that particular government entity and you really don't well that's a false claim um, and so they're using that to ensure that entities across the board are you know really thinking about and implementing appropriate cybersecurity in their organizations um, I, I mean, I could go on and on and on. I talked about the FTC. We have the high tech amendments in 2021. Um, you know, CISA just the other day, which is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure um, Security Agency, they're responsible for carrying out the um, Cyber Incident Reporting and Critical, Critical Infrastructure Act of 22, 2022, CERCIA. The law went in place, but it says it's not going to be effective until we have standards in place. You know, so all of these entities have to be cognizant of the different reporting obligations because under CERCIA, when those proposed rules go into play, which will be in probably, you know, mid-2025, we're looking at a data breach with a 72-hour notification requirement. HIPAA gives you 60 days, but entities have to in in healthcare is part of the 16 designated critical infrastructures so that's going to be another enforcement piece that we're going to start seeing when we have data incidents you know the the biggest one is the change healthcare i mean we're still seeing issues coming out and identification of you know what happened in change and i think that's going to take a long time 
it'll be interesting to see how OCR, how, you know, all of the other agencies and whatnot react to that in a, in a penalty perspective. You know, if you think about change healthcare, they did one thing that was probably the easiest thing to have in place. They did not have MFA, multi-factor authentication. And that's what was, that's what led to the collapse of change healthcare. That's how they got in. So, Mm -hmm. you know, recognizing, you know, cybersecurity as part of your compliance program is something that you absolutely have to have in place. And you have all of these different entities that you have to consider, states, federal agencies, and everything else. And if you're a global practitioner, you've also got privacy and data protection all over the place. We're in Michigan. We're right on the border of Canada. Canada's data privacy that if you have patients that come over here from Canada for whatever services, I don't know why they would. We, you know, They've got universal health care, but you know, they're over here vacationing, you've got those obligations that you have to consider as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that those are, those are I mean, it, I, I think the one thing um, that you that you touched on, and as I transition into um, uh, the next slide, uh, that's a great transition into the next slide, is the very, uh, the tentacles of government enforcement, right? Um, and the ability for it to use its broad discretion, either in interpretation or it's an ability to enforce and make very subjective interpretations of your internal controls and operations is so important as to why the not only the existence of a compliance program is so important, right, but the maturity of it. And, you know, Joe a little bit talked about earlier is like, so what are, what are we really defining as your investment into compliance? And I could tell you from a consulting perspective, this is something we consistently talk about with clients because the common question is, is like, is it absolutely required? Do I have to do it now? Is it really that big of an issue? Um, and I think other, the, some of the talking points that all of you have touched on is, well, it's not always about what's right now. It's the things that are on the horizon. And I always uh, label or define compliance as your ability or your adaptability to operationalize these legal requirements, right? And so we've talked about the importance of um, having a compliance officer, whether in-house or outsourced, you know, Joe talked about um, having somebody who has that nuanced subject matter expertise, having somebody who understands when and how to engage legal. Um, You know, one of the things that uh, we did and I recently talked about is how are you measuring that, right? So from a consulting perspective, one of the things we're always in is we're, we're in a billable model, much like law firms, but a lot of the, our clients are very revenue and sales driven. And so they want to see an ROI and everything that they're putting in. And so creating dashboards and metric and KPIs that are related to improve results, your ability to be more flexible. Some of these ROI are intangibles within the culture of your organization, and they're not always going to be on a bottom line financial dashboard. Um, and and some other uh, another key piece too is like yeah, the the speed the speed and ability for us to uh, be able to um, uh, adapt to changes within the industry, which some, many times come very swiftly and quickly. And um, some of these requirements, you know, we talked about uh, uh, one of the enforcement actions that we talked about is that you have sixty days. Sixty days in the healthcare world moves very fast. And so you you may have a certain amount of time to respond or report an overpayment or um, have a specific notification go out. And if your compliance infrastructure is either non-existent or not mature or isn't have has the proper uh, stake within your company's operation, then you're going to struggle to do that and make that type of change management. Being conscious of time, I just want to um, transition into, uh, we do have a slide on key takeaways that you can review at your own leisure, but just transition into the Q&A portion uh, to any questions that our attendees may have um, or submitted. I, If there's anyone on the line that wants to either submit them now, come off mute and ask a question, please feel free. I know we covered a wide, wide array of topics, but with if if we're going to wait on some questions, um, I think one one last thing I would uh, probably just ask to the um, uh, presenters today is uh, if if you are going to take away 
uh, something to some uh, healthcare entities, clients as to, you know, planning for the 2025 year and what you should be thinking about your legal and compliance strategy. What would be your one takeaway? I'll start with uh, Joe and being conscious of we have a few minutes left. So maybe what your one key piece um, that you'd give to a potential client. So I, I would figure out what are the top like two or three risks uh, to the organization and what investments need to be brought in or built up to uh, prevent anything from happening. Um, I think in uh, Deb point in cybersecurity is I think at all time high, regardless of the size. So that's a huge one. Thanks, Joe. We did. Um, I think I would uh, want attendees to take away um, just really knowing um, your culture. I know we always talk about the culture of compliance, but that's what drives a lot of this, right? So it's if we have our um, employees trained properly to know what a phishing attack looks like or what malware looks like, then we'll be able to have them report that out. And maybe we won't have a change healthcare on our hands, or maybe we'll have an employee feel comfortable going to the compliance officer internally to talk about a concerning thing as opposed to becoming a whistleblower at the U.S. Attorney's Office, right? So I think taking a pulse of your um, your community, your employees, and just really focusing on what that culture looks like in open communication and transparency. Yeah, awesome. And Deb? Yeah, I, you know, one of the takeaways, and I hear this often through my clients, that, you know, if you're reporting to a board, they may not necessarily want to buy into a full compliance program or a full cybersecurity program. And, you know, it, it's kind of a carrot and a stick approach. You know, the, the carrot is we do this and we avoid, you know, reputational damages and, and everything else. And we maintain the privacy of our individuals and we, you know, maintain good, good habits in what we do. The stick approach is, you know, you get to the point where you want to threaten them and say, look, at this is not just good business sense. This is keeping mm. our operations going and going, out yeah. of jail. You know, the sentencing guidelines, that's where the seven elements of a compliance program came into play from the U.S. sentencing guidelines. So it's always been there. And it's something mm. that the government looks at in determining whether or not you're going to, you know, the difference between jail and a fine. And I will say that, you know, the DOJ changed its charging of corporate clients or corporations a few years back and said, you know, previously you could hide, you know, the individuals, the board members who may be responsible and just charge and convict the corporation. Those days are over. Individual liability is absolutely there and it's absolutely being enforced. So, mm -hmm. you know, if they don't want to listen to the benefits of it, then tell them the risks as it is to the individuals and to the entity. Thank you so much, Deb. Uh, I want to be conscious and respectful of everyone's time. So thank you, Joe, we did, Deb, for joining us today and having really, really great in-depth discussion. And I know this is something that we can continue to talk about probably uh, for, for many days, but um, to all those who registered, thank you so much and thank you for attending. You'll get a copy of the slides as well as the recording, um, including contact information for all of us. Um, uh, please feel free to reach out and um, uh, look forward to speaking with you guys all again very soon.